And I think that we're at that point of like a crisis moment as humanity is like having the mirror turned on itself. So like we've built all these amazing technologies and the industrial revolution and civilization and all these things that we think are the ascent, you know? But then when we start to get closer and closer to the peak of that, we look around and we're like, oh my gosh, we're interconnected with all things and we need to have respect for our environment. You know, we need to stop like, uh, we need to have appropriate technologies that work with the whole. So that's part of what I feel like my work in this world is, is to work on my own self, my own consciousness, in order to get to the point where I can offer this gift of awareness and seeing that we're all interconnected. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are at Consciousness Hacking's Awaken Future Summit. We are now gonna be talking to Ian Michael A. Bear. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate yeah, it. It's good to see you again. Good to see you again too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. <laughs> There's been a lot of leveling up uh, in the meanwhile. I'm so excited to talk. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Michael, let's start with who you are and what you represent. Sounds good. Well, I typically identify as being a human being, which is a really you know, interesting concept and experience. And uh, I grew up in the middle of Alaska in this lifetime. And so deep in my veins and in my psyche are wild places. And I've always been an explorer of the wilderness, whether it's the wilderness that is the natural world or the wilderness that's inside of us. And that wilderness has the whole possible spectrum of experiences, beauty, challenges, um, and that's really who I am. I'm an explorer of, of all of that, and I'm a creator. I grew up the son of a carpenter, used to build custom homes that were you know, uh, appropriate to northern climates and energy efficient and ecologically designed and all of that. And as I got into my teenage years, I had the dawning realization that not all of humanity has the same experience as me and that there was a lot of suffering in the world, you know, and including in my own family and living in the North is not an easy thing, but I realized that a lot of people throughout the world are really disconnected from themselves and from the natural world. So my early intentions for this life were to move to the jungle in Central America and try to live inside of an eco community. Didn't quite end up working out that way and life has had a, a different circuitous path to that, but I really have always had this desire to live on the land, live in community, and just live a, a good healing life, like a very simple good healing life. And that has manifest as uh, different ways that I've served humanity through retreat centers or getting a master's in counseling psychology and serving many different diverse populations and um, serving Esalen Institute, the birthplace of the human potential movement and just continuing to track and listen to who are the people that I want to be aligned with, what are the organizations that really call to me. And so I would say that's kind of in summary what, who and what I'm up to all the way from having the, the wild roots in Alaska, all the mm -hmm. way to yeah, the identification as a human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and then just the weirdness of that experience, the beauty of that experience, and then mm -hmm. all the way through um, figuring out how to, you feel like there's some sort of a strange disconnection of humans from source. Mm -hmm. then, yeah, okay. Yeah. Teach us more about this. Yeah, for sure. I think that it first starts with a disconnection from ourselves and a disconnection from others and a disconnection from the natural world. And um, our essential nature as life, as, you know, as part of this ongoing process of DNA and adaptation and evolution is something that our ego forgets, that we're part of a process. We identify with these like moments in time how we fit into society, how we fit into our environment. And so we get really, you know, kind of, uh, we build up this whole concept of who we are. And in reality, that is gone in a moment. And so, you know, I, I was just describing this experience um, earlier at the conference. We were doing an exercise to talk about a moment of awe. So there was this woman, Cassandra Vaitan. I've worked with her at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. She was sharing how 
Uh, the founder of Institute of Noetic Sciences, Edgar Mitchell, was the sixth man to walk on the moon. And when he was coming back from walking on the moon, he was looking outside the capsule and he saw the sun and the earth and realized that it's all one unity. He had a moment of Satori. And so... Satori. Yeah. Teach uh -huh. us about that quick. Yeah, on the yeah. Satori was basically um, a term that is used to describe uh, a moment of recognizing the unity of all things. So he was looking down at the earth and he said, oh my gosh, all human experience is contained on this, on this ball, as far as we know, you know, and that all life is contained on this bar, ball, as far as we know. And there's no divisions of countries or species or any of it. It's all actually one unity of consciousness. That was what he experienced. And so after she gave this prompt, I was sharing with a colleague, a uh, guy, Martijn Sherp. He's got a retreat center called Synthesis. They do psychedelic work in the Netherlands. And um, he's a partner on this project that I'll get into more about Holos. And um, so we were paired up and I was describing to him a moment of awe. And when I was 19 years old, I climbed the tallest mountain in North America, Denali, in the middle of Alaska. And it's actually the tallest mountain, terrestrial mountain in the world from base to summit. It goes from 2,000 feet to 20,000 feet. So we climbed over the course of 22 days to the summit of this mountain from the lake to, to the top of the mountain. And about 18 days through, it was the dawn of my 20th birthday. We were hiking up a ridge. It was, I was out about 17,000 feet, so pretty tall up on this mountain. And I was looking out towards the northern horizon. And the sun hit the horizon and then, and then came back up. And there was this moment of profound stillness and in stillness, we have an opportunity to see things from a new vantage point, possibly a more clear vantage point. And I could feel myself, my sense of attention and awareness, merge into the whole earth, merge into the sun, and I could feel the way that the earth was tilted towards the sun in the summer and tilted away from the sun in the winter, and the way that each day is a spinning of that cycle. So like, I got to experience through my mind and through my awareness, like merging into our solar system. And the reason I share this is I think that it's analogous to, to the ascent of any man and ego, where we think that, or any woman and, and ego, where we think we're like, or even civilization, we think we're like climbing the mountain, we're like getting to the peak of some experience. And then when we, we start getting closer to that peak, we realize that actually, like we are consciousness and all things are conscious. So like part of my experience and my belief is that all things, including mountains, are actually conscious. All life is conscious. The universe is aware. It's a self-aware universe. Um, and I can't remember what the prompt was that, that uh, initiated that story with you, but I think it's an important like, analogy for just the, the folly of our experience as human beings and what we're doing. It's like we try to build all these things and then we end up coming to the realization. And I think that we're at that point of like a crisis moment as humanity is like having the mirror turned on itself. So like we've built all these amazing technologies and the industrial revolution and civilization and all these things that we think are the ascent, you know? But then when we start to get closer and closer to the peak of that, we look around and we're like, oh my gosh, we're interconnected with all things and we need to have respect for our environment. You know, we need to stop like, uh, we need to have appropriate technologies that work with the whole. So that's part of what I feel like my work in this world is, is to work on my own self, my own consciousness, in order to get to the point where I can offer this gift of awareness and seeing that we're all interconnected. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good one. Okay. Yeah. The um, the prompt being that we disconnect from the source, and you give us this really profound illustration of how mm -hmm. we have these moments of of deep connection. Edgar Mitchell. Yeah. Edgar uh, Mitchell. Huh? Yeah. From Noetic Sciences. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. What a profound one. And then also yours on Denali. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These types of experiences. There's no going back to the old mental maps. Exactly. It's, it's the upgrades, and they're gorgeous yeah. upgrades. And yeah. that um, hopefully we can provide more experiences like that to um, humans. And when humans are born in metropolises that don't have um, the cosmic the views of the cosmos, or that barely have breathing space in parks and, and mm -hmm. nature's and stuff, it's just like 
feels very disconnecting at times and yeah. when we're in, so embedded in the economic machine and so distant from spiritual practices. It's, mm -hmm. yeah. So we have a lot of, of the physical 3D world to build in ways that uh, get us there faster to this reconnection back to mm -hmm. the, the unity. Um, okay, so then, okay, so then walk us through, so you gave us that example of the disconnection from source. Now you're connecting to your own divinity, your own this this level of consciousness that you that you that you are are striving to kind of upgrade yourself to be able to then bring forth better tools and um, awareness shifts for other people mm -hmm. is that right yeah yeah okay absolutely and then what is what has been kind of those uh, milestones for you in terms of where you're like aha uh aha -huh, aha uh -huh, mm -hmm. uh -huh, and then what are the things that you've been building yeah absolutely thanks for asking um, I think those aha moments have kind of uh, come through a lot of different modalities. So they, it could have been as simple as being seven years old and running down a trail through a birch forest and like feeling a sense of elation and awe and beauty and wonder and kind of dissolving into the forest in a sense, you know. And then there's been all these different moments that um, have helped weave a tapestry and understanding of how the consciousness within me can recognize the consciousness beyond itself as actually one and the same. And so psychedelics certainly were a big part of that journey in my teenage years. And, and then I reached a point where they served their purpose for that time. And so the majority or all of my 20s were more in service to family, meditation, gardening, building homes, like very like more earth-based things but the internal contemplative practice continued, um, mostly through meditation. And so I had a teacher in India, still do, and, and, and I had many experiences with them that uh, were very psychedelic experiences, you know, were, were fully transcendent of the world of form. And so I recognized that there's a lot of pathways, you know, to getting to the same destination. It's like all weaving back to, to source, as you were saying. And um, so most recently, I spent a number of years at Esalen, and that kind of reopened me to the world of the human potential movement, psychedelics, the teachings of all of the, um, you know, like luminaries of the 60s and 70s. And, and uh, as I finished my time up and my service up at Esalen, I started to look at, okay, I experienced a template of how we can live and how we can learn and how we can grow together there. And how can I bring that into the world? How can I bring what I learned from childhood about right way of living and what I learned from Esalen and Chino Hot Springs, how can I bring that into the world? So that has led me to this concept of holos. And um, it's a bit of a tip of a hat to Stan Groff. So Stan Groff had lived at Esalen at one point and was considered one of the co-founders of transpersonal psychology. and. He developed a technique called holotropic breathwork, which was basically a means to, um, to transcendence, healing, and, and he developed a whole map of the inner landscape of what people would experience through holotropic breathwork. And I think for him it was, it was partially a means to going into these transpersonal states that was legal. You know, it was like a point when the LSD research that he had been doing very legally in the Czech Republic wasn't allowed in the U.S., and he developed this this idea of, of um, the holotropic paradigm, and that was basically like returning to wholeness. It was like means for moving to wholeness. So holos represents wholeness, and that's a journey that each of us takes individually, and that we're taking as a society, and that we're realizing our wholeness with the ecological realities of this globe yeah okay okay so it, it, it makes more sense so then the experiences that can kind of lead us to the feelings of wholeness mm -hmm. can be like you said as simple as being walking down the path and mm -hmm. seeing becoming one with the forest dissolving into it mm -hmm. um, and then taking us all the way up to the work at Esalen and being um, around the thoughts of the luminaries of the past that have built up some of the uh, the the updates that we've had uh, with our awareness shifts, you then find that um, holos wholeness. Mm -hmm. And what exactly is holos building? 
Yeah. yeah. So Holos is building experiences and then ultimately centers that honor the power of plant medicines. Mm -hmm. So specifically psilocybin, San Pedro, and ayahuasca. And those being kind of a band of plants that have been helping humanity, especially the indigenous people of North and South America for thousands of years. Yeah. Um, and we believe that those are generally accessible to the public and that they're also getting a lot of attention for being powerful healing modalities for things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, working with end of life issues. So we're basically ally, we're using these allies, these plant allies, as a means to helping people return to w what actually is, which is that we are already whole mm -hmm. and that our relationship with the earth is what is needing really some, some work as a species. And so um, we believe in working with these allies through experiences and through centers to show people a new template for how to be and how to live. Thinking about the, the thousands of years of use of psilocybin and San Pedro and ayahuasca and what it's actually been able to, to do for, for millions of people and, and now being in the mainstream culture, is there a way now to get through the taboo and to get to this, the, the utmost signal with these mm -hmm. centers that are, that, that are being built? You know, you listed some, you know, synthesis. Mm -hmm. Also, you've just done a lot of work with transformational retreat, centered design and development. So you're extremely familiar with these processes. Mm -hmm. So is the, is the idea then um, physical locations that people then come to those locations and then go through multi-day long processes? Exactly. Nutritional, uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, body movement as well as exactly. plant medicine. Okay, mm -hmm. teach us about what it yeah. looks like, yeah. Sounds good. So. Um, one thing that we're recognizing in the field of psychedelic medicine is that there's a lot of need for more preparation and for integration. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the psychedelic experiences. And so the intention is that the um, experiences will be held within a bigger context of a, you know, a multi-day, probably at least a week experience where people do have a holistic approach to healing, where there's good food and you learn about personal practices and develop your own personal practices for taking whatever gifts you receive from the plants into your day-to-day -day life through meditation, embodiment practices, whatever those things may be. Yeah. It's, it's very much like if we're to take this word holos um, and, and really work with it in our own selves and lives, it has a lot to teach, you know, like just the concept of wholeness. It's like um, you're talking about like the more mainstream adoption I think that if we look towards the future, at the same time we need to look towards the past, and that's how it grounds it. So in the past, these traditions were really held with a lot of reverence in indigenous cultures within the um, context of community. And so that's a big piece of what those traditions have to offer the future, is like that is a beautiful template and there's specific ways to honor these medicines that if we look back at the, at the past of what really worked, we can probably build a template for the future that is also going to work and be more accessible. And the template that you're talking about here of mm -hmm. the past as well, how, how does the template of the past interplay with modernity, mm -hmm. with the information yeah. technology age and stuff? Yeah. yeah, it's an ongoing conversation. You know, it's like um, this moment is having a, is, is an integration of the past and the future. And so this moment, it's like, how do these um, plants and states of consciousness um, relate to this present moment and what humans are doing? Mm -hmm. And what I've found is that, you know, there's an intelligence in the plants themselves that is interacting with the present moment and really looking at it, you know, like as an actual entity, like, hey, what are you, what are you humans up to? And like, we have something to teach you and maybe you have something to teach us. And there's like actually a dialogue going on. Like there's an intelligence coming through humans too and through our capacity to build technology and AI and, and, and other, um, you know, AR, VR. Like there's something in all of that that is actually evolutionarily useful, otherwise it wouldn't be occurring. So like instead of having a dogmatism around like 
here's nature, here's man, here's technology. Mm -hmm. I have a real curiosity about how are all of those things part of a conversation that's happening and how can they learn from each other? Whoa, okay, so then there, there is a something that's Im embedded deeper in the consciousness of the cosmos that is at play between technology, uh, plants, and humans. Mm -hmm. And, and our, uh, the, that, that interplay to actually double click into it and dissect it and figure it out um, mm -hmm. rather than maybe just in many ways sometimes it feels like the distractions away from what's actually uh, important to unpack about it. What, now how, how do we get deeper into what plants are telling? So by doing things like Holos and going out, so we need to send the AI ethicists and programmers to Holos to, is, is that kind of a way to do the feedback loop with technology and plant medicine? Yeah, that's definitely one possible way. And um, I think a lot of like, I think a lot of the artists, musicians, creatives are also really weaving um, the lessons of plant medicine and psychedelics into their creations. And so that's another way that that dialogue is happening. But yeah, I have um, sat in medicine circles with people that are you know, pretty far on the AI side, like working in AI. And the best, um, you know, the best case scenario that I can see is that we embed into some of these artificial intelligences also ancient intelligence, you know? There's another kind of AI. There's ancient intelligence and there's artificial intelligence. And so hopefully, you know, through um, care and consideration, some of that ancient intelligence and knowledge will get embedded into our technologies. Um, I was just using this analogy yesterday, er, earlier today of like, Okay, so let's just say that science tells us the universe of form is 13 to 14 billion years old. Um, mushrooms are like 2.5 billion years old. Um, there's rock formations that human beings can see that are around a billion years old. So um, if you just were to like look at it from the, from the standpoint of infinity, you could kind of look at 13 billion years as not that long. You could look down at it and say, okay, here's 13 billion years. There's a lot of intelligence in the physics of everything that was created during that time. There's a lot of intelligence in the 2.5 billion years that mushrooms and fungus have been around. There's a lot of intelligence in the, in the rocks. And then human beings, it's like a tiny little blip in, in all of that 13 billion years. So I would hope that like we can have enough reverence for the universe to recognize that there's there's a weaving and there's an intelligence that we have to learn from in yeah. what created us and what the, you know. So, and what the plants have to teach, what the fungus have to teach. Yeah, yeah that's a real big history perspective on, <laughs> on what's happening. We love big history and to, to view at, to view it, and I love how you added, sometimes we look at just 13.8 billion and then we go, oh, that's everything. But then you went mm -hmm. infinity. And when there's infinity and you look at 13.8 billion, then that looks small. Right. And that's a great, that's a, that's a great way to add them, um, the big history uh -huh. scale. So then, yeah, you look at the, I didn't even know that, um, that, uh, so, so fun, fungus in general mm -hmm. is? 2.5 billion years old. Damn. Yeah. Damn. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, if, well, for some for some reason, it's just is that older than trees? It's older than uh -huh. yeah yeah. Wow, for sure. So that's some old stuff. Yeah, and so you know it like there was a person in our session earlier that was talking about a really strong psilocybin journey that they went on, and they came to the point of actually having an interaction with the psilocybin and the spirit of the fungus or the consciousness of the of the fungi apart from himself. And so like just to have that that idea or that awareness that like human beings, like you and I are having a conversation, well what would it be like for you to have a conversation with a uh, entity that has been around for 2.5 billion years and has been like spreading its mycelium and yeah. watching this whole thing happen. Um, I had a conversation like that with the Grand Canyon two years ago. So I was kayaking down the Grand Canyon, recognizing that these rocks that I was looking at were 
um, almost a billion years old. So I started like having this conversation with them. Like, <laughs> like, what have you seen? seen? You know, <laughs> that's like pretty impressive. Yeah. You know, and then it's like our whole folly of oh yeah, we're creating AI and our fears around that, or f some people's fears around that, or climate change, or all these things. Like they are, you know, they are real, especially like climate change. You know, it's like that is causing the sixth mass extinction, or it's one of the cause causal factors of the sixth great mass extinction of this planet. But you know, in the grander scheme of things, if you're a rock or a fungus and you're watching all this, you're kind of like, huh, you really think you're that important, you know? And so it's good to put things in perspective and, and the mind has the capacity to, to, to hold all of yeah, the, yeah. those potentialities or stories. I mean, ultimately they're kind of stories. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the hefty dose of humility mm -hmm. that is administered through thinking like this and also, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and on also the, um, th that there's so much to get into conversation with something as ancient. Ancient intelligence, mm -hmm. AI, embedding ancient intelligence into artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Embedding AI and AI, that's, uh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, that's that's excellent. That's excellent. And even the idea of something being artificial, you know, it's like, what does that definition actually mean? Yeah. You know, yeah. like um, to another species, that people have like, been saying it's not a good. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's probably yeah. not the right term. Term. And we'll yeah. we'll evolve out of that. Term. We'll evolve out of the term. Uh -huh. I wonder what, yeah, super intelligence has been another mm -hmm. common one, but super intelligence meaning non-narrow intelligence, so mm -hmm. that's a general intelligence that's even able to self-replicate itself and mm -hmm. do additive manufacturing and all other kinds of crazy things. But um, on, I, I do much prefer something like a, like a super intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad that you, that you mentioned that, you know, artificial, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But then, you know, just to like weave it all the way back, it's like we have the capacity to under, understand all these things and, you know, the mind ha can, can look at all the different aspects of reality and create culture. And, um, and then for me, I end up coming back to like, I'm in a body, uh, you know, here I am, consciousness in a body, consciousness pervading a body. And what does my body want? You know, my body wants some really basic things like, to be comforted and to have good healthy food and water and air. Yeah. And so that's a big piece of the holos narrative, but also of just like the human experience. What does it mean to be a whole human? You know, and so I think we've come, we've, we've gotten kind of separated from that as a species. And it doesn't mean that we can't embed holistic ways of living into cities. But for me personally, it's really about a deep dialogue with the natural world. So yeah. yeah. So holo centers will be embedded in nature just to remind people of that yeah. interdependence and like perfect harmony that we can live with in nature. On a on a on a scale of what's been passed down to us by our ancestors up until our little 25 or 50 year blips of time, let's say, mm -hmm. compared to what maybe has been passed down through um, fungus or through other um, yeah, yeah. It just, I, 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 yeah. What carry, what carries more intelligence, you know, mm -hmm. in its vehicle, us or the, the those systems, and so mm -hmm. it's always an interesting thing to to contemplate. Mm. Ho Holos is coming in in a very timely manner. Are we able to at all approximate when there's there will be a center available and where? Next year we'll start. Um, okay, we'll start prototyping experiences. Uh, at the beginning of the year, yeah, next beginning year. of 2020, in in yeah. North Central South America. -ish. Yeah, we're doing the research right now on all the on le legal jurisdictions, okay. and okay. so initially it'll be experiences, and then okay. the center itself will likely be in Costa Rica first. And okay, then we're great. waiting for the North America and Canadian policies to catch up with um, ancient culture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's. Quick, quick thought on this. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about the reason why the uh, ancient intelligences of plant medicines were banned was due to their uh, their catalyzing of feelings of unity, which would sacrifice mm -hmm. the economic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
Absolutely. I mean, there's like so many trails to go down there. One, I think it's the suppression of the feminine and like um, the hyper masculine culture that has basically said like the natural world is there for us to dominate. And when there's plants talking to you or talking to a culture, an indigenous culture saying, hey, you're part of everything. Um, it's not a really popular way of seeing or being when you're in a system that needs to dominate. So I think that's like the primary unconscious thing that's happening. And then there's the next layer, which is here are like religions or practices that the indigenous people were doing. And if we can take away their um, culture and their practices and, and make that wrong, then we have the upper hand, you know? And so there is the Religious Freedoms Act. So there's things like the, you know, the Native American church that can, that can work with peyote or San Pedro. Um, or there's the UDV, or there's, the, you know, there's, there's practices where you can work with ayahuasca in the U.S. Um, within the Religious Freedoms Act. So that's like one safeguard that these plants have. But for a long time, I think that was a big piece of the suppression, is that um, it's about culture and suppression of the feminine. And then beyond that, it's like if there's um, substances that are legal, that we can tax and we can get people hooked on, then that's a really great formula. Or if there's substances that we can make illegal and we can get people hooked on them and then send them to jail because we're trying to take a certain population and keep them out of the power structure, um, those are really good means to controlling a society. So you've got alcohol, highly addictive, tobacco, highly addictive, and taxable. And so that's a really good reason why a government might want to keep that, those two industries really strong. And then you've got things like heroin or cocaine. And as a government, you might want to keep those strong so that you can choose populations that you want to keep out of society and send them to jail. Whereas, so, I mean, I'm giving you kind of a broad. I love it. Keep going. And then you've got psychedelics, which, which are actually like a liberation of the psyche and aren't addictive in the same ways. And so, you know, like those are the ones that you want to put into schedule one, say that they have no healing value and um, and, and there you have it because it, it breaks down the system of your control. Whoa. So, yeah. So w whatever is yeah in aim to control um, has uh, has had a grip on uh, on on uh, pr propagating the economic machineries of the structures that currently exist and um, suppressing the healing properties, the unity properties of things like psychedelics and, mm -hmm. and so much more. Um, it's always fascinating to me thinking of what a simulation would look like if we uh, grew up in a matriarchy mm. and just seeing and feeling what would be some of the great characteristics, what would be some of the ones that aren't so great and mm -hmm. how would we take the great ones, how could we implement them into what we currently have now? Yeah. Just all different types of things like that. It just, it's kind of more. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. such a deep curiosity of mine and I end up bringing it back to myself and like working on, you know, really coming to terms with the masculine and feminine within me and having them in some form of harmony and, and unity. That's yeah. kind of like a first step. And then maybe I'll have something to say um, and contribute to the larger <laughs> conversation. Yes, yes, yes. Um, two quick questions, you, Michael, two quick questions. Um, mm -hmm. Are we in a simulation? I don't have an answer to that, yeah. I mean, it, largely, like, yes. Um, in the sense that everything that we're experiencing is filtered through a very, very small bandwidth of reality. And so, um, in the sense of a simulation being just a, a small band of, of what we can experience that's actually to some extent manipulated by our senses and by our memories and by what we're expecting to see, um, then we're a simulation that we're creating. You know, we're in a simulation that we're creating mm -hmm. to a large extent with the way that our mind is wired. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've been having some really fascinating thought processes and conversations though around what is happening with AR, VR mm -hmm. and like more immersive experiences that are created by technology um, and by man that even like s simulate natural experiences in nature and how that has therapeutic benefits actually for relaxation and all these things and at the same time we're moving pretty far into the 
like the movie The Matrix, where you're just hooking yourself up and, and living in a, in a simulation. So um, I don't necessarily have all the answers to that, but I have, I have glimmers of the ultimate reality and truth, so I don't take too much of this, um, you know, I take it all at face value. And then the last question is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Well, the first thing that came to mind was my kids, you know. Um, and I think that um, there's a way that we see as parents our own innocence within our kids um, and, and like our own beauty and creativity. And, and so I think the most beautiful thing in the world is probably creativity and innocence. It's like going back to that seed moment that the universe started expanding and things moved into greater complexity. It's like whatever that moment of conception was that the sperm and egg come together or, you know, in other species, you know, when those when that moment of creation happens, I think that that's the most beautiful thing and you can see it in a child's eyes with the like twinkle and excitement. It's like it's that same moment of creation that is in a flower that is blossoming. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I would say that's the most beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I love it. <laughs> uh, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Yeah, thanks it's good you to see you again. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you so much for coming mm -hmm. on the show. Yeah, brother. This was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. What's the link for uh, Holos? Holos.global. Holos.global, everyone. Check out the link in the bio to that. Also check out the rest of Ian Michael's links in the bio. And also support the organizations, the entrepreneurs, the artists around the world that you believe in. Conscious Hacking's links are below. Support them. Also Simulation's links are below. Support us. And have more conversations around the world with our friends, our families, our coworkers, people online on social media about plant medicines, about these retreat center designs and development and this unity, how we can get there most effectively together. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Boom. Nice. That was a blast. <laughs> that was really fun. Good. I'm glad you had a good time. I had a great time. Yeah. Yeah, you were uh -huh. such a pleasure.